Okay. Um, so we are talking about phase two. Phase two over here, whereby sigma is equals to zero. So I gave you a simple example. Sigma is equals to speed plus distance, where P, P is one, P2 is one. So it's equal to zero. If this is the case, then how does the equation look like? You can solve for it. You take Laplace, it will give you this. You take Laplace, which means you take Laplace of this. It will give you this. And then, uh, then after that, you make y the subject, then you inverse Laplace, you will get this. If you see this, and uh, P1 is one, P2 is one. So uh, it will always be negative. So when T is large, then Y will be equals to zero. And then you can see here a few things. Why I say P1 is one, P2 is one. Uh, that, that's our simple example. As long as P, P1 and P2 are positive, which means essentially as long as this pole of the transfer function is stable, which means the roots is on the left-hand side, this y will give you zero when t approach infinity. In, in, in the other way around, if it, once it's unstable, then y will go to infinity. So that one is basic control theory we know. So that was one of the requirements that I say, this polynomial must have roots on the left-hand side. That is to make sure that this y t goes to zero. So that's the first thing we note. The second thing we note is, what is this y naught? All right, this y naught would be this one here. You see, I say, I don't know, it come here or come here or come here. But when it comes here, why is y naught? As far as phase two is concerned, y naught will be this value here. Okay, this will be y naught. All right, this will be y naught. And then y naught, this is the initial y value, it will go to zero. So it goes to zero, if you look at this, you look at this, you look at this, you know uh, it will go to zero exponentially. And we all know that this inverse of this is a time constant. In control, if you write this properly in this transfer function, then you know P1, P2, we always call it T, and T is the time constant. So P1 over P2 is the time constant, it appears here. And we know uh, time constant means the time it takes to reach 63% of the final value. So which means if this is starting, this is the final value, it will take uh, time constant P1 over P2 to go two thirds of the distance, 63%. All right, so finally to reach here, maybe it will take three time constant. Okay, so that is what I taught you last week. And uh, we go through one tutorial question. Okay, let us go through a second tutorial question today. Let, let me check, is it recording? Okay. <laughs> okay, look at question two. All right, so you have a first order system and then the process is given here. And then um, question A asks you to determine why analytically 
given that A minus and A plus is A is equals to 0.5, B is 1, D plus equals to D is 0, M is 2. The initial value of X is 1. So basically, it means what? It means that A is 0 0.5 over here. B is 1, D is 0. All right. And Y is equals to X. Then the question say M is 2. So this is 2. So now the question asks you to find Y analytically, which is the same as finding X. So now the first thing we want to see is the question say, the starting point x naught is equals to one. So x naught is equals to one, which means let's say you are one kilometers from home or something like. That. So you see, so what is sigma naught? Sigma naught is just minus x. So sigma naught would be equals to minus one. So what is u? U, the starting part for U would be equals to to sine of minus one you put this inside here, right? So it should be equals to minus two. So you start off with a control signal of minus two. So you start off you remember, uh, you have phase one, phase two. So your phase one, your control signal is minus two. So let us now start to do the, the math. So the first thing you do to solve this, you can use Laplace to solve this. All right, you use Laplace to solve this. Let's look at the solution. Okay, so it was this. It was this. This is U. You use Laplace to solve this. So Laplace of this is this. Then Laplace of this is this. Laplace of this is this. Then after that, you rewrite, make X the subject, you will get this. Okay. Then remember u the initial u was minus two, so u of s. So this one must give u of s. You take Laplace of minus two, it will be equals to minus two over s. All right, Laplace of a constant is the constant over s. So Laplace of minus two is minus two over s. So if you stick that inside here, you stick that inside here, then this whole thing will now look like that. All right. Then you inverse Laplace, you will get this. And x is equal to y, so these two are equal. So you will get this. So now you check if t is zero, x naught is one, which is our initial condition. So earlier on, I show you the example was, uh, you got distance, you got, you got this y dot is equals to, it, no, that was one. y is x is y axis is equals to x2 then this one is y dot is equals to x1 and then you got a sigma equals to zero line all right this is the sigma equals to zero line all right 
that example I gave you in the lecture, you have a X1, X2 is because it was a second order. Here you got only X1, there's no X2 because it's a first order example. So to draw the same kind of graph here, you only have X1 or X. All right, and then uh -oh, you can have a zero and then you have a one. So when I first started in my example in the lecture notes, my sigma was somewhere here, it was 150 and then this was 50, so it's here. All right, then in this particular tutorial question, my X naught was, the question say is equals to one. So my X naught is here. So which means that the cross here correspond to the cross here. So for phase one here, in the example, in the lecture notes, phase one go to look for sigma equal to zero line. So this is phase one. Here, because it's only one dimension, you will also look for sigma equals to zero. Sigma is equals to minus x. So sigma equals to minus x is equals to zero means that x is equals to zero. So this would be the sigma equals to zero point. Here was sigma equals to zero line. So this is the sigma equals to zero point. So phase one here will look for here. So here you will look for here. All right. I mean, to make myself super clear, of course, you will be on the x-axis all the time. Okay. So this one would be phase one. So I also teach you how to find the time to go from here to here, you need to know. So here, we also need to find the time that it goes from here to here. So since you have X is equal to this or the same as Y equal to this, how long will it take to go to X equals to zero? So you just equate this to zero. You just solve for T. So if you do that, you get t is 0.58. All right. So this one, I call it t sigma equals to 0 0.58. So it takes 0 0.58 seconds to reach sigma equal to zero. Then uh, we know that for phase, for second order system, you have a phase two. Phase two, there are two things. One it will go to the origin. This is phase two. Two, sigma will always be equal to zero for phase two. So now it will collapse into this point. Phase two is nothing but just here. This is phase two. The two thing is just here. Sigma is always equal to zero for phase two. And it will also collapse to the origin. That's it. All right, because it's a 1D. So this is the first part of the tutorial question. The second part, basically, the second part then says, uh, if there is a variation in the plan, here, the first part was 0.5. If there's a variation in the plan, all right, um, which means it varies from A equals to minus to plus. So, all right, A is between A minus to A plus. I don't know, maybe A minus is 0.2, A plus is 0.8 or what, we don't know. But there's a variation. All right, and then the state X, the, mag the magnitude also got, about so there are variation in your plan now your your a 
which is this, can vary between plus and minus. All right, D also, there's an upper bound. So how, how do you make your controller still work? But the requirement of the sliding mode control is very uh, minimal. The main thing that it will work is the slope of your V curve must be negative. Then your V curve will drop, 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 drop because V is equal to sigma square over two. If V drop, 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 then finally your sigma will be equal to zero. Okay, then, so how to make sure that? So we just make sure that the V curve is always less than the negative, the, the slope is always less than zero. So the V curve is this, all right. Then now we go and write down the slope of the V curve. So you just differentiate with respect to time. So let's look at the answer. Okay, so the plan is given by this. All right, this is copied from the question. All these are copied from the question. The V curve is given by this. So I need to find the slope of the V curve. So you differentiate V with respect to times. You differentiate this, you will get this. So you keep this. Then you know sigma is equals to minus X. It's given in the question. Sigma equals to minus X. So if you dot this, then you go and dot this. All right, so you dot this. Then X dot is given in the question that it is this. So minus X dot will be minus A X minus B U minus D. So you stick that in. Then you do the algebra, you rewrite it nicely like that so that U sticks out. Then you know u is given as m sigma. So you substitute this. All right. Now, then here you see a pattern. How? Okay. The first thing to say is, so your slope is given by this. Then the next thing, there's a sigma here. You multiply the sigma into, into the bracket. So you multiply this by sigma. So I put, I put sigma here. This one I also put sigma here. Now, sigma sine sigma, this is always a positive number. Because if sigma is positive, sine is one, so it's positive. If sigma is negative, sine is minus one. So sigma sine sigma is always a positive value. And M, you choose it to be a large positive value. Then that's it. This second term here will always be positive. So then I, I don't care whether the first term is positive or negative. I don't care really. I just choose the second term here, a very large positive value so that whether this is positive or negative, the whole thing, you will be subtracted by a very big negative, uh, uh, will be subtracted by a big number so that the whole slope will be negative. So, so you find the biggest value of M that you can find. So, so I put all the big, big one, the A plus, the X plus, the D plus, and you know, all over here to be M. So that's it. If you choose M to be this, then this M, will always be bigger than this value here. Then this will always, the slope will always be negative. Okay, so that, that's, that's the whole idea. All right, now we'll move on to another topic. Now, I'm supposed to teach you 
adaptive control. So Prof Lee teach you some adaptive control. I teach you some adaptive control. Now you must know when to use Prof Lee adaptive control and when to use my adaptive control. And you must see the big picture. And the big picture is here. How to look at this? This one tells you when to use a various adaptive control technique. Now, you look at the top row here. The top row basically gives you the plan or the process dynamic. Okay, means what? If you have a plan or process, the dynamic is constant. Means that the plan don't change, right? the transfer function of the plan don't change. The, the state space value of the plan don't change. If the transfer function, if the time constant is three, it's three today, it's three one year later. If the gain is 1.5 today, it's also 1.5 later. So which means that, that that piece of machine, that process, the time constant don't change. Okay? Then example would be, simple example would be, you have a spherical tank that looks like that. Very common in the industry. All right, you need to control the level of chemical in the tank. This is the input. This is the output. Maybe chemical reaction takes place here. Now, whether the level is here or here or here, because the cross-sectional area of the tank is uniform, the gain is uniform, the time constant is uniform. So the transfer function, if this is input, we normally call this U, if this is the output Y, the time transfer function between U and Y don't change. Then you have a constant plan. If you have a constant plan, do you use adaptive control technique? Yes or no? If you, all right, look, here would be the con resulting controller that you should use. And you all need to know this. If not, you all learn already, then you go out to the industry, you look at the broad, you don't know what to do. You don't know what to use. You learn all the technique, then you don't know which one to apply. All right. You can, you can straight away imagine, if the plan don't change, your controller, of course, don't change. All right. So you use a constant controller parameter. This is what I write here. Constant controller parameter. Because the plan don't change. So your controller, of course, don't change. This year, use the same controller as the next year. So if you use the most common controller would be a PID. So if today your PID, the gain is one, two, three, next year should still be one, two, three. That's it. Now, so does adaptive control have a, a place in this problem? Yes, it still does. The main thing about the controller is that you don't know how to set the controller, which means you got a PID is your gain for P1, I2, D3. Do you say one, two, three, or say three, two, one, or one, four, seven? <laughs> you don't know. You, you just go, oh, there's a tank here. Then what am I going to do? All right. So, the adaptive control, which I'm going to teach you next, would be what we call auto tuning. This one means 
in the industry, sometimes they call it tuning in demand. It means that you have a controller, all you need to do, you, you go there, press a button, then the controller will identify the transfer function of the plant, for example. Then after that, do the controller design, let's say do a state space, all right? Or go and using whatever controller design. Once they identify the transfer function of the plant, then they'll design the, let's say, PID controller for the plant. Then once it's done, it will be fixed, all right, in front of you. Auto-tuning means you go there, you press a button, the controller will, will identify the plant. Then after that, set the controller parameter. Some are more conservative, ask you, you agree or not, you agree, you confirm. Then they set the PID as one, two, three, confirm. That, that's it. Then once confirmed, it will be confirmed this year. Next year will still be the same, same parameter. If you are not happy, sometime one day you are not happy for whatever reason, maybe you change chemical or you 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 find that eh, the something not, not quite right, you can go and repress the button. When you press the button again, the whole identification process takes place again. They will identify the plan again and then design the controller again, ask you, you want this new one or not? So you say, okay. Let's say right now they, they say instead of one, two, three, they say 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, you agree, then done. So in this case, the key thing is that the person must press a button, must initiate, and then the controller will change. If you don't initiate, the controller will not change because the assumption is that you have a constant parameter plan and there are many out there. All right. So that is one application. Two, there are also many plan out there whereby the process dynamics are what I call predictable. So predictable means what? You, if you go to the industry, you will see that there are many tanks that are conical or cylindrical. So if input is here, and then chemical reaction takes place, you see if the level is here and if the level is here, you know the cross-sectional area is different. The gain and the time constant when your level is different will be different. All right. So the transfer function at this level and the transfer function at this level will not be the same. Another very common will be spherical tank. All right, you have input. So you have level here and then level here. The cross-sectional area here and the cross-sectional area here is different. And you, you all know it will be there because I'm sure when you were in secondary school, you go to chemistry lab, you, you put core chemical into this type of conical flask, no burn, 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 then no smoke come out. Sometimes you put chemical into the cylindrical flask, then you go and put under the fire, then the smoke come out. All right, in the chemistry lab, we already use conical flask or spherical flask. That is in the chemistry lab, small, small one. If you go to the chemical industry, there'll be huge, huge tanks. All right, then, and now all these dynamics are predictable. Why is it predictable? Which means you, all you need to, you can predict using the you can predict using the height. If the height is here, you have transfer function A. If the height is here, you have transfer function B. If the height is here, you will have transfer function C. 
Though the transfer function A, B, and C are different, but they are predictable, which means uh, if you your height is here, you know it's transfer function A. If your height is here, you know it's transfer function C. So it's predictable. If it's predictable, then in the industry, what they do is they use the strategy, what they call gain scheduling. Basically, it means that you, the first day when you have this tank, what you do is you go, you will use auto tuning first to form the gain scheduling table, they call it. Means what? First day you buy back, you got this tank, what you do is you increase the, you put the chemical level to here, you go and do auto tuning, you go and press the button. So the auto tuning, Algorithm, which I will have to teach you, will go and find the, identify the transfer function. So they found it's A. Then they'll design the, let's say the controller, the PID controller. So you got a PID controller A. So, okay. So they'll keep it. Then you will increase the level to here. Then you press a button. Then the algorithm will find transfer function B. Then they'll design PID B. Then you come to here, they will find transfer function C, then PID C. Then they'll put it inside a table. So from then onwards, when you operate, when the level is here, they use transfer function A. When the level is here, they use transfer function C. All right. So, and it's a simple idea. If it is between here and here, they will interpolate between the transfer function A and transfer function B. All right, so which means if the, the gain here is one and the gain here is two, they'll say that the gain here is half. Basically, they'll do some interpolation. If it's closer to here, then maybe they'll see, uh, maybe this is closer to one, they'll proportionally interpolate. Maybe here will be 1.25, all right, because it's 25% here, 75. Let's say this, this is one meter, this is two meter, at 1.25 meter will be one. Or two five again. Okay, so the the PID parameter they also interpolate. So in that case, if you have a plant that has a predictable uh, process dynamics, now if you look at a controller, your controller parameter, you see the first one is such that. The control parameter is constant. Whereas here, the parameter, controller parameter changes. But the changes is predictable. All right. The controller, you know, is PID1, PID A, PID B, PID C, or is interpolated between PID A and B or B and C, all right? So the control parameter, you can predict it based on the height of the chemical. Okay, then of course, come to the third one, which I believe is what Prof Lee teach you. The plan is totally unpredictable. So then your controller will always identify the plan. All right. And you identify a new plant, then you it will give you a new controller. Then you constantly identify the plant, the plant change, the controller change. The plant change, the controller change. So because the the uh, parameter of the plant is unpredictable, so your end up your controller parameter is also unpredictable and it also changes. Okay, I stop here for a while, go for a break at 7, 10. All right, I'll continue the story. Oh, sorry.